Good morning, and welcome to the Indiana Clinical and Translational Sciences Institute workshop on navigating the regulatory pathway for medical devices, a conversation with the FDA, clinicians, researchers, and industry experts. I'm George Wadica, Deputy Director of the Indiana CTSI uh, and the Dane Miller Head of Biomedical Engineering at Purdue. We're delighted that so many colleagues from academia, healthcare, industry, and government have come together today to discuss the future of regulatory approaches that facilitate the development and translation of safe and effective medical devices of all kinds. I would like to thank each of the organizers for their tireless efforts and our many supporters who have made this day a reality. These include our keynote speaker, Jeff Sharon from the FDA, co-directors of the Indiana CTSI, Sharon Moe and Sarah Weehy, Dean of the Indiana University School of Medicine, Jay Hess, Purdue Dean of Engineering, Meng Chiang, as well as Purdue Vice President for Research, Teresa Mayer. The significance of our regulatory ecosystem is clearly evident as the life sciences industry in Indiana continues its record growth toward 2,000 companies and $10 billion in annual product exports. This industry encompasses a broad array of medical devices, from diagnostic to therapeutic, cardiovascular to orthopedic, and ambulatory to intensive care. At the very heart of these efforts are a very unique set of academic, industry, and government partnerships that are collectively the difference makers that fuel innovation through talent development, idea generation, and the translation of new medical devices into the marketplace and clinic. Our Weldon School of Biomedical Engineering at Purdue continues to be a proud component of the Indiana CTSI with roots in implantable device development going back to Leslie Geddes in the 1970s. Our efforts continue with the Medical Technology Advance Program that over the last decade has uh, translated more than 250 projects through various translational stages toward company partners, both large and small. Technology licenses have spurred company growth provided opportunities for many individuals, including our graduates, generated royalty streams, and in turn helped millions of patients worldwide. The goals of today's workshop though, are not to rest on any such past laurels, but rather to consider how we can collectively improve our approaches to meet the burgeoning needs of these very dynamic times in which we live through a new set of novel technologies that we might bring to bear. I'm now delighted to introduce to you the co-director of the Indiana CTSI, Sharon Moe, who will provide a brief overview of this very unique translational institute that thrives in a sense on medical device development. Sharon. Thank you so much, George. Uh, making sure you can see uh, the slides. Can you see slides? We see your, uh, maybe your desktop or. Okay, how about now? Yeah, yeah, there you go. All righty, so some reason it wants to stay on that side. Okay, well, I really appreciate um, uh, the invitation today to talk about the Indiana CTSI. Uh, I will have just a few minutes because I wanna also introduce a new discovery and innovation pathway that I think is going to be particularly of interest um, to the participants today. So on behalf of my co-chair, Sarah Weehy, let me begin. So just to get everyone oriented, the CTSA are awards that are NIH funded and are nationally connected by regional hubs. But importantly for Indiana, this grant really represents only 26% of the total funding for the Institute. The rest comes from the cost share from the campuses, Lilly, State of Indiana, Cook, and other contribu contributions. The overall budget for the CTSI is 24 million per year, supporting 147 FTEs, 20 programs, and 80 service cores. So we call ourselves the Indiana CTSI because we are more than that NIH award. We are truly a statewide institute, a statewide network of three 
uh, outstanding research, research institutions, the School of Medicine campuses, multiple health partners across the state, and many, many regional companies, foundations, endowments, um, and uh, again, many, many, many companies. So we are a infrastructure grant that has been turned into a statewide network by which life sciences can excel. This is the leadership of the CTSI, and I'd like to take a special thanks to George, who has done an outstanding job in leading Purdue and the CTSI. So what's our vision? Well, we want everyone to get healthy in Indiana, and that's a, that's a, uh, an admirable goal. But to do so, we know that we have to bring together Indiana's brightest minds. So the Indiana CTSA grant, we affectionately call it 3.0 because it's the third round of the grant and the fourth one is due next spring and this is the aims from that grant and really uh as really kind of gives you a picture of all that we're trying to accomplish but in just a few minutes today i want to talk about the acceleration projects that we have ongoing so we believe very strongly in providing investigators the best possible infrastructure for them to succeed and we do so with a number of what I like to call one-stop shops. One-stop shops means that we make it easier for the investigator. They don't have to do so much work because we do it for them. So the project development teams are one such example of a one-stop shop. In this committee, we actually bring together individuals who are experienced on NIH study sections. They have diverse background. We have regulatory support, and it's a regular standing meeting. So when, rather than an investigator having to go talk to 10 people and get different, confi often conflicting ideas, they go to one place, and they're actually able to get a, a dearth of opinions, or a lot of opinions, rather, uh, from individuals at the same time. And here, our goal is extramural funding from the NIH and the DOD. And we have eight different teams spread across all of our campuses that are based on different content expertise. And in fact, the PDT's advice is actually almost as good as money. So in the course since 2008, about 5 million in small pilot grants have been given out to 383 participants, yielding over $182 million. So this is just an amazing, amazing return on investment. So now we are actually moving that into what we would call innovation. And this is something that we're calling the think tanks. And again, for all CTSI partner institutions. So the same concept, we bring people into one room at the same time where the expertise includes drug device development, entrepreneurs, SBIR, STT funding, regulatory expertise, business plan expertise, commercialization offices, and this is called the think tank. So we have one that we're doing for drugs and biologics and one that we are doing for devices. The start, starting point for the drugs is a, an idea, some sort of a, a molecule. For the device think tank, it is a prototype, and it can be a very rudimentary prototype. We will do the same kind of concept where we will do milestone-based small funding and an iterative process. You get $10,000 to do X, Y, Z, you come back to the committee, and now we take you to the next level, all with this hand-holding, one-stop shop guidance from people who have the expertise. And of course, in this situation, as opposed to NIH grants, our goal is actually spin-off commercialization companies and SBIR, STTRs. So I'll close by just introducing this device think tank membership that had their first meeting last week and thank very much Andrew Brightman and John Merrill for co-chairing this. And if you have any questions at all, you can contact Kara Garcia, who was our navigator for this program. And as you can see, we have a lot of members who have experience in various therapeutic areas related to devices, and we're really excited about kicking off uh, this think tank process. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Sharon. And I just wanted to add that uh, the recording will be shared. So if there was something on the slides that you missed or wanted to get some of those uh, email addresses, we'll send out a link to all the recordings after the meeting and, and you'll have access to those. All right, so thanks, Sharon, and thank everyone for joining us for this uh, you know, exciting day to discuss the opportunities we have to really improve the processes for translating medical devices from discovery to clinical care. Uh, I'm Aaron Lattis, Associate Professor of Engineering Practice and Biomedical Engineering at Purdue, uh, and, and until last summer, spent my career in the medical device industry. 
So in the past, we focused these retreats on various disease states and how we can improve care in those particular areas. This year, we're taking a little bit of a different approach by focusing on one critical area that nearly every medical device and drug has in common. They must pass through a regulatory process before becoming available to help patients. So to bring new and innovative medical devices to market efficiently and effectively, we need to understand the different challenges that may be faced and how we can overcome those challenges. Looking toward the future, as new products become increasingly complex and include multiple components, such as an implantable device coated with a drug that also collects, interprets, and transmits uh, chemical, metabolic, or mechanical signals and data, there'll be new technical and regulatory challenges that must be addressed. And notice that we call this a retreat rather than a conference and the afternoon breakouts workshops, not sessions. While this might be a minor grammatical detail, it's also an important point. We don't want this to be just another series of talks uh, you kind of listen to and then mostly forget about by the next day. We try to design the next five hours to be an interactive discussion for everyone to share challenges and questions and help come up with ideas and answers. They can help all of us advance our knowledge and continue to work toward improving the development of new medical devices from concept to the clinic. While we most certainly will not have all the answers by the end of today, we do hope to take at least one small step or even better, one giant leap toward improving the lives of patients that need our help. We know this cannot be done alone, which is why one of our goals today is to bring together a far reaching group of stakeholders who can work together and develop ideas and best practices on how to optimally achieve success when translating products through the regulatory process. The diverse and highly talented speakers, co-chairs and panelists, whom I'm very thankful for sharing their time and agreeing to join us today, represent a cross-section of the medical device field, including clinicians, academic researchers, industry professionals, and regulators from the US FDA, all of whom play critical roles in maintaining a vibrant and productive network for the development and review of medical devices. Additionally, our over 500 registrants represent a range of experiences from biomedical engineering and med school students who represent the future of the field to new and seasoned professionals who are working daily to identify and overcome various challenges to those retired from active practice who continue to use their extensive experience to help guide us to solutions. We have the opportunity today to take all of our diverse backgrounds and experiences and learn from each other to forge their way to a stronger future where we can make a difference in the lives of patients that we serve. So let me just briefly walk through an overview of the day and few logistics. Uh, in the morning, following our keynote discussion, we'll have a series of short talks to help step us through the translational pathway and start to stimulate thoughts and questions. We'll wrap up in the morning with a panel discussion. And then after lunch, we'll, we'll break out in four parallel workshops to discuss pediatric medical devices, diagnostics and disease detection, digital health and wearables, and invasive and implantable devices. These are intended to be interactive discussions. So please use these workshops as an opportunity to bring up questions and ideas that you might have. In the final 30 minutes this afternoon, we'll come back together as a group to hear highlights from each of the breakouts and consider how to take what we've learned today and continue growing and advancing toward better processes and practices for medical device translation. Our goal is not to spend a half day talking about all the wonderful things that we do and what we already know. Rather, we want to look to the future and identify, identify how as a community collaborating with each other we can be prepared for new challenges and identify and overcome those challenges before they become, can become problems, thereby leading the way in medical device development and translation to more efficiently and effect, effectively bring innovative products that are safe and effective to patients in the US and around the world.